Hey, y'all. I am so excited to share this session with you. This is one of my absolute favorite topics, choice boards. There is so much to share. So let's get going. Here is the shortened link to this presentation. Of course, the link is also down below this video, like it is for all of our sessions in the conference. But if you like to take pictures um, to save your links, now's the time to do that. But just in case the shortener isn't working for you, it's the long link that is linked down below. So you shouldn't have any issues with that. But you can follow along. There are tons of other resources and links in the slides. So you don't want to miss um, some of those free resources that I'm sharing with you today. So if you haven't met me before, like I said, my name is Casey Bell. I'm a digital learning coach, blogger, speaker, author at shakeuplearning.com. Everything that I do is in the name of helping teachers learn how to use technology meaningfully in the classroom. So I do that in various ways. Like I said, uh, I write blog posts, I write books, I do some speaking like I'm doing today. And of course, we have the Shake Up Learning Show podcast as well. There are some links on this slide if you want to connect with me or if you want to connect on social media, all of those little icons will connect there. And I would love to connect with you and answer any questions that you may have after today's session. Of course, the comments are open down below. So don't forget that you can ask questions there. Of course, this is asynchronous, so you may not get an answer at the exact time that you post your comment, but we will be monitoring those. I'm also Google certified, and I say that just because I spend so much time talking about Google. Um, Google has a way of making it into all of my presentations, as you will see even in this choice board presentation today. So the first resource I want to give you is the Teacher's Guide to Digital Choice Boards. This was a little ebook that I put together a couple of years ago. I did um, the same name, uh, as a podcast episode and a blog post, but the big PDF download that has tons of information in it is completely free. So you'll see there's a link down in the right hand corner so that you can download this free ebook. I will also put a link below the video so that you can go grab a copy of this. Um, it is fully loaded with lots of ideas, including the ideas that I'm going to share with you today. So let's talk about it. What is a choice board? <laughs> it's all about choice. That's, that's the bottom line. It is all about student choice. And some people call these learning menus. That was kind of the first word that I was introduced to. So it took me a while to kind of make the shift. But I feel like more people say choice boards than learning menus. And it's just a form of differentiated learning that gives students a menu or choice of learning activities. They can be created in a variety of styles and mediums. It can be a list on the board. It doesn't have to be fancy, um, but it can get more intricate, complicated, even creative if you like. And you're going to see that today. These have been around a long time, way before I even started teaching. And of course, they originated in a static paper format. But with technology at our fingertips, we can make these much more engaging and interactive for our students. So let's talk about the why behind this. I loved choice boards because when I introduced this to my students, it became a different classroom. And I understood better how every student didn't have to do the exact same thing at the exact same time. And if you look at this classroom that's easily 100 plus years ago, these are students crammed into a tiny, tiny schoolhouse, and they do not look happy to be there. Although they are one-to-one -one with slates, if you will notice that. Um, that little boy in the front row there, he is definitely giving the teacher a look. <laughs> but when I thought about becoming a teacher, I wanted to be the kind of teacher that I had 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 but it was also sort of that traditional teacher in front of the room, desks in rows, everybody doing the exact same thing at the exact same time, because that was how I was taught and I didn't know any better. And even though I was the type of student that 
I could actually survive in that that mode. It wasn't necessarily what was best for every student. So being able to differentiate is a key piece to meeting the needs of all of our learners. And the biggest part of that for me in terms of learning menus and choice boards is being able to provide that flexible learning path because the way I get to the learning goal may be very different than the way that you get to the learning goal, and that's okay. So we have the ability to differentiate for students and offer them individualized paths, personalized learning, and things like that. But we also have the ability to let students take some of that ownership by making their own choices and finding their own path, their own way, while we're guiding them on the side. So when I first started teaching, you know, I had gone through all of my teacher prep classes. And of course, I understood in theory what differentiation meant, but I didn't know in practicality how in the world I was going to make that happen in my middle school classroom. And so this was really what shifted my thinking. When I had learning menus in my classroom, I suddenly had a light bulb moment where I could see better ways to differentiate, not only with the choice boards, but to be able to see how my students operate in that mode, what type of learners they are, what types of activities actually engage them, and help me even adjust those lessons that were more whole group or where every student was kind of completing more of the same style of assignment. But this really was me dipping my toes into differentiated instruction and assessments all at the same time. So of course, we hear a lot these days about students' voice and choice. We've even got I, probably several sessions in this conference that focus on student voice. And that's exactly what we're giving them. When we give them a choice board, when we give them a learning menu, again, those words are interchangeable, so don't get confused when you see them here. I believe that students can make decisions and they need to learn how to make decisions. We'll get into some some tips a little bit later, but this can be difficult. This can be a difficult transition, not only for the teacher, but for the student. But we should be empowering our students to make choices and to use their own voice to create and demonstrate learning. So I always come back to Carolyn Tomlinson, who I believe is one of the definitive voices when we're talking about DI, and this is what she says. At its core, differentiated instruction means addressing ways in which students vary as learners. And that's what we're going to do with our choice boards. We're going to be able not to just list a bunch of different activities or different tools that students can choose, but actually design some meaningful learning experiences for students that help them reach the learning goals in a way that addresses who they are as learners. So what do learning menus or choice boards look like? Well, they can look like pretty much anything you want them to look like. I've got some examples I'm going to go through and share with you. But like I said, this can be a simple list. It can be a tic-tac-toe. It can be bingo style or get as creative and intricate as you like. So I have three examples on this page and I do keep a Pinterest board. It's kind of gotten out of control, <laughs> but anytime I find a choice board, whether it's, you know, just a printable one or it's actually interactive, if I like something about it, I put it on that board. So if you like to jump over to Pinterest and see, because there are so many different contents and grade levels, I want you to be able to find examples for what you teach. So each one of these images is linked. So here we have the tic-tac-toe, and we're going to break the tic-tac-toe down in just a moment because this is my favorite, but I just want to point out, this is just a sample that I made. Um, I was a middle school language arts teacher, so this is something that I would do in my classroom based on a novel study. It is summative in this example, but with tic-tac-toes, it can be formative or summative. And I'm going to kind of explain the colors in a little bit, but I also want you to know if you're new to Google, you can go to File, Make a Copy, 
You do not need to request access, or I've even made it easier and you can just click this link and it will prompt you to make a copy. Then our middle example here, this one was um, shared with me and I don't believe I even have the name to give credit, but I did not create this. Um, just another example, I'm not exactly sure if it's officially a tic-tac-toe or if students can choose, you know, whichever one they want. Because you can kind of look at a table as choose one or you can kind of approach it with the tic-tac-toe idea. And then this last one here is from my buddy Tommy Spall. I share this one all the time. He calls us the digital menu for student creation. And I have another one from Tommy I'm going to share a little bit later. But Tommy's a tech coach. And so his is like a restaurant menu. We have entrees, appetizers, sides, beverages, and desserts. Now, this one is uh, a little bit tool focused at the moment, but that's because he designed it so teachers can adapt it for their own content areas. And so if you click on one of these, it's going to take you to that project, um, even a project rubric, and you can navigate through this. So this one becomes much more interactive than kind of those first two examples that we saw. So where and when can I use them? Well, learning menus and choice boards can be used with any age group. I have seen them used with the littles, although they have to be more visually driven. If they can't read yet, I have used these with adults. I've used these <laughs> with middle schoolers and high schoolers. Pretty much anyone um, can do a learning menu or choice board. They can also be used in any subject area. Yes, you can use a choice board in PE. Yes, you can use a choice board in foreign language, even in culinary class. We can make these fit any subject area that we want. They can also be adapted for short activities or big projects. So that's one of my favorite things is that um, learning menus and choice boards are very flexible and allow us to adapt them to lots of different options. Are learning menus and hyperdocs the same thing? So this is a question I get a lot. If anybody's been introduced to the idea of a hyperdoc, stay with me. So I would say no, but um, they could be part of a hyperdoc assignment. So officially, a hyperdoc is a very different entity and it may involve choice. So it, it could be part of it, but I would not say that these are the the same things. A learning menu or choice board is simply a menu of choices from which students can choose. It doesn't necessarily meet all of the other um, criteria that make a hyperdoc. So a hyperdoc is a complete packaged assignment that also meets some additional criteria. Um, so they're they're not the same thing. If you're if you're kind of like, oh, it's just like a hyperdoc. No. Um, and if you're not familiar with a true hyperdoc, I would encourage you to visit hyperdocs.co and to see the criteria that they recommend because it's not just a, a, a you know a doc with links. It's much more uh, foundational than that and includes a lot of great pedagogy in it as well. So types of learning menus and choice boards. Like I said, simple list. You can put a list on the board. You can put a list in Google Classroom. It doesn't have to be complicated. Tic-tac-toe, uh, bingo board, restaurant style menu. You can have learning style choice boards, four C's choice boards. Uh, possibilities are limitless. Really, uh, you can do anything you want. You can adjust this. Like I said, it is so flexible. Um, I do have a post that I did several years ago called Interactive Learning Menus with G Suite. Of course, it's not called G Suite anymore, but if you want to dig in to some Google-specific ways that we can create these interactive choice boards, that post is there as a resource for you. Okay, let's break down the tic-tac-toe. So I have to tell you, this is the first thing I tried in my classroom. And let me tell you the story that I always tell when I'm talking about choice boards I was still what I call a baby teacher. I think I was in my third or fourth year, still still learning. I didn't student teach, so I was kind of sink or swim. And um, I was on emergency certification, but I was still learning. And I had just moved to a new school district that I was actually 
becoming a better teacher. They were offering me some great professional learning. But one of the initiatives that they had for middle school language arts teachers was to do small group instruction. So we all got the little horseshoe tables put in our classroom, and we all received our small group instruction training, but no one was really showing me what this looked like in my classroom. And I I point blank asked, what are the other kids doing? Because at the time, I barely looked older than a middle schooler, and I did not have the best classroom management. So I'm wondering, how do I manage this while I'm teaching a small group of three to five students? What are the other 25 doing? So someone introduced me to this idea of the learning menu. And the tic-tac-toe was the first one that I tried, and I kind of loved it. So let me explain what I learned in the lesson design and what I quickly adjusted to. So like I said, tic-tac-toe is great for daily. Like you could do like a 15 or 20 minute activity or you could make this like six week um, cumulative projects. It's simple but effective. It's not overwhelming because if you're sticking to a true tic-tac-toe, they're making three choices. That's it. And we'll get into some tips later, but choice can be overwhelming. It's overwhelming for adults, and it's definitely overwhelming for students who have never been given that opportunity. And of course, you can easily create a tic-tac-toe in docs or slides. All you got to do is make a table. And in case you don't have one, you can make a copy of mine. (laughs) So if you click this, it will open up the prompt to make a copy of this tic-tac-toe menu choice board template that has the table right here for you. And it is designed with some some specifics that help me as a teacher. So first of all, you'll notice that I numbered my squares and my directions say start with number five. I numbered my squares because I quickly realized that my students needed a reference because I got a lot of, hey, miss, you know that thing? (laughs) Okay, which one are you talking about? And sometimes, you know, there might be a lot of overlap between the choices. So you want to make it clear. Numbers may also help you associate um, with your grade book or an assignment in Google Classroom if you're individually assessing each of these. The reason that I start with number five is because I learned something the first time I did this. It did not take my students long to look at the choices and y'all know the kids that are looking for which one of these is going to take me the least amount of time and the least amount of effort. Well, I quickly realized that I needed to make sure that wasn't even a possibility. So I needed to eliminate the option to make the tic-tac-toes on the edges. And the way I did that was forcing the middle square. So if you force the middle square, That means they have to make one choice in blue and one choice in yellow. And then I began to see the lesson design there. That means that these blue could align with one learning goal. The yellow could align with another. Um, The blue could be research. The yellow could be creating something with that research. So, you know, really options are limitless. They, They could all be summative at the same time. But this also helps you find more balance in that so you're not facing what I faced with my students. So I do love the tic-tac-toe for that reason. And that design in particular really helped me. Of course, you can leave it open. Um, You can do, do it however you like. Some people like to give extra points. Some people like to do blackout, whatever it is. Um, But that really helped me wrap my head around how to design it better for my students. So here's another, or here's the example I actually showed you earlier, and you can click on it and open it up if you want to see the novel study tic-tac-toe. Like I said, this was summative. This was at the end of reading a novel. So there really wasn't a huge difference between blue and yellow. It was more about finding the balance in rigor and the time management. So we'll talk about that in the tips section as well, because it is a little bit difficult. No student ever completes the same assignment at the same time as every other student, so just keep that in mind. But I have some examples. So I have the novel study. I also have used this when I'm teaching 
um, Chrome to teachers. So I have a PD version. If you happen to teach teachers, I want to take a look at that. You can make a copy and make it your own. I haven't actually um, taught Chrome in a while, so it probably needs um, a little updating, but it's still useful to think about how we can model this in a professional learning environment with teachers so they can experience what it's like to complete a choice board. I also created a blank tic-tac-toe in slides. I kind of like slides better than docs. And if you've listened to me for, for very long, you'll understand how much I love slides. I do call it the Swiss Army knife of Google. And it does so many things. But I like this because you're limited with how much you have in those little squares. And sometimes we need to link to more information. Maybe it's linking to deeper directions, to a rubric, um, to, you know, other tools, whatever it is. And it just doesn't quite fit in that square. And with docs, yeah, you could link down below and use um, bookmarks to link in in that. But with slides, it's just a little bit easier just to link slide to slide. And so if you want to, you can make a copy of this one as well. This is the template link, so it looks a little bit different. A lot of people like the template link because you can see it. And then you just click on this blue use template if you want to add it to your drive. Template links don't always work great on mobile, so I always use the make a copy link as another option. Um, (laughs) I already hit on the lesson design, but let's hit that again. Remember, we're going to number the boxes. The middle square is your non-negotiable or your must do. Um, Some teachers also use that middle square for a free choice, and I wouldn't do that the first time. I would definitely get my students used to the idea of choice and menus before they're allowed to propose their own, and I would definitely require that they get teacher approval before they are allowed to actually start on that. And then, like I said, I do color code those boxes to help with the lesson design, but also help students understand, okay, I've got to have one in blue and I've got to have one in yellow. Um, And like I said, you can align the colors to learning goals, um, depth of knowledge, four C's, whatever it is that you're working on. Now, if you are working in Google Classroom, assigning choice boards um, should be fairly straightforward, but I want to give you a few tips. Typically, students don't need to edit the choice board. Now, you may have a different type of choice board, or maybe you want them to edit it or write on it or mark it up in some way. But typically, the ones that I see and have used are what I would call read only or view only. So when you're assigning in Google Classroom, attach it from Google Drive and students can view the file. You don't typically need to give students every um, student a copy then they edit, then they forget, then they try to change what they're actually doing. So that eliminates some of those frustrations. I also recommend that you give students a deadline for making their selections, not just a deadline to turn it in, because um, there is decision paralysis that goes along with this, especially the first few times that you do it. So you want to make sure if you assign this and you're like, okay, you have you have 10 minutes, um, to do 10 might be short, especially the first time, but you want to give them ample time to read, to think about it, maybe even discuss it as a class or as a group before they make their their selections. And you could have them drop a comment in the assignment in Google Classroom. You could have them submit it in a form, whatever you prefer. And that way they're held accountable and they're not constantly changing their mind and then running out of time. So there are a million other types of menus. I want to give you some more examples. So math teachers are often the ones that come to me kind of struggling with how to use technology. So I have found several different options for math menus. And of course, these can be digital activities or they can be, you know, physical activities. They can be, you know, like rolling dice or using cards or you know, whatever it is that you're doing, but many of these can actually be translated into digital formats as well. So, you know, if they're flipping a coin, y'all, if you didn't know this, you can go to google.com, type into the search, flip a coin, and there's a digital coin that you can flip. So there's, there's lots of different ways that we can translate this. And 
I think with with math teachers, sometimes we um, kind of get stuck in just we don't have enough time. We have to do the exact problems and then turn those in. But think about how we can translate this to help students better understand the concepts as well. Uh, multiple intelligences menu. So this is an example. This is not one I would assign straight out. For me, this is more like an example for teachers to see some ideas. This has way too many choices on it. Even for experienced students, this would be overwhelming. So you don't want to give them too many choices. So again, that they spend too much time just trying to make the choice. But I like taking a look at this so that if we need to hit those multiple intelligences that we can find ways to do that. And of course, art. Um, so this one is a really interesting one that I found for elementary art history. And it also coincides with the multiple intelligences. So there are, like I said, there's something for every subject area. And even if this isn't your subject area, you might be inspired especially if you are STEM or STEAM in ways to kind of incorporate those things into multiple content areas and disciplines. And then this one, which is a mitosis tic-tac-toe, was made in Buncee. And so I'm going to open this up so you can see it a little bit better. It's by Jennifer. I don't know her last name, but um, somebody shared this with me on social a while back. And she took the same idea from my template, she just made it prettier in Buncee. So um, it is still color coded. She is still starting with number five, but we do just have something that's a little more visual. And you'll notice if you hover, you also have some audio options. And of course, now if you're doing this in Google Slides, you can also insert audio. Um, I do love the Moat extension, which makes that super easy. M-O-T-E is a Chrome extension that allows you to insert audio in a lot of different places, but um, it definitely is great for using it in slides as well. And then the bingo board. So this bingo board is from my friends Amber Tiemann and Melinda Miller. They created this several years ago. It's in my first book, and this was for teachers. So this is PD. So stay with me, whether you teach teachers or you teach your own K-12 through students, there are lots of ways to use this. This is overwhelming for a first timer. But what is great about this is they're quick hits. These are short things that teachers can do during the summer. They had prizes associated with them, lots of different things. But you know, watch a TED Talk. Okay, follow five new teachers on Twitter. Can this be translated for your classroom? Absolutely. However, I don't like bingo for a lot of reasons on a day-to-day -day basis. It's too many choices. It would take way too long, probably, <laughs> to design. I like bingo more for enrichment and extra credit. So if you have students who are early finishers, this would be a great way to just kind of plug in some of those assignments and that they could do and use and learn from there. And if you want to click on this image, it will take you to Amber Tiemann's post where she shared this way back in 2017. This is a uh, learning menu that I created just kind of to show an example of the four C's. I believe the four C's are so important for our students, and I wanted to give something that was an example and something that teachers can adapt. So, of course, we have the four C's across the top. I have numbered these. But that first row is really um, a lower level. Um, and then the bottom row is much harder and really, you know, depending on which, which thing you follow, higher level of blooms, and more depth of knowledge, those types of things. So we go from under communication number one to summarize. And summarization was something I had to teach. It's not necessarily easy for all students to learn that. And then we go all the way through, and if you look at creativity, just to compare, number seven it say, may sound familiar, lists as many uses for a paper clip that you can think of, and that um, comes from the Sir Ken Robinson's TED Talk, Do Schools Kill Creativity? 
just a quick little exercise. You can replace the words that are bold and underlined so that you can adapt it for your own classroom. But look at number eight, reinvent school. That's a much bigger project that involves many more ideas and things than something like number seven. So I tried to give you really kind of some shorter, smaller activities and deeper activities. But if you click right here, it'll take you to the blog post where you can go make a copy of it. But that slide deck also has the teacher's guide with my recommendations. So kind of explaining here's where, you know, change these words, be sure you look at this and here's some here's some tips here. So that is all available for you. Ah, yes, we talked about the template link. Let me just give you this quick tip. If you have wondered how in the world you make your own template link, well, you can hack the URL. And so, let's see, do I have it on the next slide? Yeah. So um, when you are editing your slides, your docs, whatever you're working on, at the end of the link is the word edit. Delete the word edit and type template slash preview. And that's how you can get the template link. Keep in mind, you still have to make this shareable. So if it's still private, no one else is going to be able to use that link. But if you make it anyone with the link can view, then they can. Um, if you're using Google Classroom, you don't need this. And in fact, Google Classroom will override it and share it with your students anyway. So that's not where I would use this. You can pop it into the comments in Google Classroom, which is kind of a workaround. But this is definitely something that I use when I post things on my website, um, if I am sending something in an email, um, those types of things, just to make sure that that link is easily accessible. All right, let's talk about how we can get a little bit more creative with our menus. I showed you Tommy's um, menu a little bit earlier, which is based on a restaurant menu. I've done a restaurant style menu before. And I'll tell you one of the things that I do, just kind of lining it up with the lesson design that I mentioned with the tic-tac-toe. So when I do a restaurant style menu, everyone has to eat dessert and they have to do it last. So there's usually something I want them to do at the end. You know, it might be um, sort of a reflection or a summary, something like that. But that helps me kind of, kind of bring everybody together but you can definitely keep going, design a restaurant menu. It can be super fun for students to kind of make their selections like they are at a restaurant and um, to make it interactive like Tommy did. So everything links to another slide with more information. Um, he did his in slides. Um, I do think slides is still kind of the best for this, but you could do it in docs, you could do it in Google drawings, wherever you want. Tommy also did this one. So this one is a Fortnite theme. I think I probably even need to update my screenshot here because uh, Tommy up updates this with the new seasons and kids will gripe if it's not the right season. So um, this is a map where students can drop and make their choices. So you see it's color coded um, by tools or teacher led or even non-digital. Um, I put a link on the slide so you can go make a copy of this from Tommy's website if you want it. And um, it's actually the same thing as the restaurant menu when you dig into it. Because it's still um, taking those same ideas that um, we have in the digital menu for student creation. It just instead of the restaurant, it is the map. So kind of up to you. And if you're teaching a grade level where students really connect with Fortnite, or if you wanted to create your own with a theme of something that's really popular among your students, this could really help engage them. And as I mentioned, I have used choice boards and learning menus in professional learning. So if I am teaching a workshop on choice boards, guess what? We're going to do a choice board about choice boards. <laughs> That's how this works. You want to model it and it's a great strategy. So if you're a leader out there, if you're someone who does deliver professional learning, this is something that I would definitely recommend you begin modeling with your teachers so they can see what it looks like, get examples, see how you facilitate, 
and also feel what it, it, it is to be in the seat of the student. So that can be a really important piece of this. All right, let's take a look at some of these product ideas. There are so many and it can go on and on and on. I do have a list of these. In fact, I think there's a longer list in my latest book, Blended Learning with Google. Timelines, book covers, comic strips, newspapers, trading cards, a social media uh, profile, which you can even fake, Venn diagram, mind map, games, poem or song, soundtrack, interview, diary, reflection, book trailer, app, um, retell a story, a PSA, annotate, commercial, presentation, 3D model, drawing, collage. It just keeps going and going. So if you're wondering, okay, if we are having students create a product on their choice board, <laughs> how do I come up with all these different ideas? There is a list to help you design that. Now, one of the number one questions I got when I first started talking about choice boards was, how in the world do you grade this, Casey? If every kid's doing something different, how do I get that in the grade book in the same slot? Well, <laughs> There are a few different ways that we can think about it. So here are some tips. I definitely would recommend that you're using a rubric, but um, this, this comment actually came up when I was teaching a workshop one time and a teacher reminded us all that the purpose of the rubric is not for teachers to grade, but to communicate expectations to students. So the rubric is not for you. The rubric is for your students. But I would make sure that you do have a rubric for your choice board. It might need multiple rubrics depending on what you are doing. Um, and the goal, you know, we always want to stay focused on the learning goal. What is it you want students to know and be able to do? And if every option aligns with that, then you may only need one, but it may get more complicated. Rubrics should focus on the content goals, not the technology. So for many years, I've seen rubrics that have requirements for presentation, must have this number of slides, this number of images, this number of transitions. Y'all, unless you are the technology teacher, don't worry about that. Can they communicate the learning to you? Some students may be able to do that in five slide presentation, some may do it in 20 slides. Um, you want to make sure that you are communicating what that goal is. Some other things to think about, um, like I said, the number of images and transitions is not what you're evaluating. They will learn that anyway, but make sure you're focused on your content and your learning targets. And be careful that you aren't using a choice board because it was an easy free download. I did an online, online, on air coaching episode, I believe it was episode 10, very early in the Shake Up Learning show with a teacher who did use the novel study tic tac toe choice board and it didn't go all that great. And so I did some coaching. We worked through the coaching cycle, the impact cycle, and discovered that. It didn't assess what she needed to know. It assessed something that she already had the answer to. So you don't want to get distracted just because something is free or even if you're paying for it because it looks really cute. Um, you have to make sure that what you are using still aligns and is revised to fit the needs of your students and to align it with your learning goals. Um, and there is that episode. I have it linked on the slide if you want to go listen. It's pretty powerful. Um, to hear how we got to that conclusion. So here are some more tips with your choice boards. Be careful that your choice board isn't driven by technology or cute graphics. Make sure it aligns with your learning goals. How many times am I going to say that in this conference? The purpose of a digital choice board shouldn't be just to integrate technology, but to leverage technology to engage learning, uh, engage learners, that should say, and help them reach those goals. Um, so you want to start small. Don't jump into something big if you have never done this before. Students who have never been given a choice will be overwhelmed by too many options. Like I said, the bingo board may look super fun, but y'all, it's too much. And as much as we like to think that students will love having a choice, many will not. 
They are used to the game of school where there is one correct answer. And when I first tried choice boards, I tried it with my pre-AP students, the teacher pleasers, and they wanted me to tell me, I mean, they wanted me to tell them which choice they should make. And I would literally come up to my desk, Miss Bell, which one should I do? But Miss Bell, which one's going to give me the 110? But Miss Bell, <laughs> we went, oh, I'm like, everything is the same. You make you make your choices and and that's it. You get to do what you want to do. And because those students, especially those students who do well at school, are so used to knowing the formula, this really threw them off. So you have to be prepared for that. Um, the students who just want to get their work done will look for an easy way out. So make sure they don't have one. Those ones who are looking, okay, which one of these is going to take the least amount of effort so I can play my game or read my book? Make sure that you balance the time commitment and the rigor. And so, um, as I mentioned earlier, you can get the free download of this digital book. I'm actually I'm still working on some new choice board resources as well. But you can listen to the podcast version if you want to dig in and, and think about some of these ideas again. If you have the all access pass, I'm going to make sure that guide is in there in those bonus materials for you so you don't have to jump on over and fill out the form. I'm also going to share with you a folder of shared choice boards. These are not for me. These are from all over um, the U.S., possibly the world, just with people who have um, shared their choice boards in a Google Drive folder. And of course, if you have the All Access Pass, you get credit for listening to any of the podcast episodes as well. So all of that is in there for you. If you don't have the All Access Pass, you're missing out. Um, there's so much in here. You'll have access to the conference all year. So it is a yearly subscription, but you'll have access to everything. There are more than 70 hours of professional development. And um, once all the conference um, sessions are added in there, and then I add um, new resources and podcasts each week. It includes all of my master classes, all of my workshops, the podcast PD, the conference bonus materials, and any new future master classes and workshops that are created. There's also a members only library of ebooks and cheat sheets. So all of those freebies I put on my site that you have to fill out forms, they're all in one library for you. So there's so much there. This is available for individuals, but if you are a school or a group, there's also special pricing available to get the all access pass. And of course, um, the Shake Up Learning Team is here to help you with all of your professional learning needs. I know many of you have already worked with some of these fabulous educators, but there is a link on this slide and a link down below if you would like to work with us virtually, in person, or you just need some support. And uh, if you are ready for more, I have tons of resources. I talk about choice boards all the time. In fact, I did a recent new podcast episode where I shared more ideas in back to school with choice boards. So you can jump into that if you want to, but there are so many different ways that we can do this. I just love, love, love this topic. And of course, if you missed the link to the slides, it is down below this video, but this is the shortened link. And I do have a link for feedback. So I'd love to hear from you. I hope you enjoyed this session and you enjoy all of the sessions and you continue to learn with me this week. Bye y'all.